All right, everyone. Hey, this is Jason Forrest. And we got a surprise guest today. We got Mary Marshall Forrest is in the house. So she had some last minute adjustments where she was able to, uh, to join us today. So uh, Mary, glad to, glad to have you. I know everyone right now is, is going to be uh, is very excited to have you on. And, and I'm sure that uh, the record breaking attendance that we already had is, is, is going to uh, like skyrocket now that everyone knows that you're here. So right now get on, get on LinkedIn and like shout it out that Mary Marshall is, is here and going to be sharing with us um, everything she knows about stopping your sales reluctance now. Is that right? Yeah, you're funny. You are funny. Yes. Record breaking numbers. Once the word gets out. Yes. Last Record minute, breaking. Got my very official headset on. I'm, uh, I'm ready to go. And I, I'm glad and I'll, and I'll see it. joking aside now. Um, this is one of, for, for me, when you, we always tell people when you're selling something, go back to the why, like your really deep why. And this, what we're talking about today and the amount of stress and the weight and the physical illness that so many salespeople feel that, pr that pressure that comes out in our body. Um, I don't, I can't, I can't handle people living like that. And I know what it's like to live with that, that type of anxiety and stress, and I hate it for other people. And so this goes back to my big why of why we do what we do, why I do this every single day. So I'm really happy to get to be here. So we had a little bit of technical, technical difficulty there, um, but it looks like we're back on. We had some people had a hard time seeing us on LinkedIn, but I think we're good now. So if, if you say that we're you say that we're good now, make sure you put on LinkedIn that we, you guys can, uh, can see us. And so just to kind of set the frame right now, uh, you know, we all know that we need to prospect uh, and, 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 and of course, follow up relentlessly to sell more. Uh, but, but, you know, sometimes, you know, we, we just procrastinate, right, to make that one extra call, to ask that one extra closing question. You know, you feel motivated to crush it. You wouldn't have signed up for uh, you know, for a sales job, if you didn't feel motivated to crush it, you've, you've got clear goals as far as how much you want to make uh, for the year and for the quarter and, and all the bonus money that you're trying to achieve. But, but what's the problem? You know, the problem is, and what we've learned from our research is that you've got these really hardworking uh, sales professionals that they've, they just struggle with a call reluctance. They struggle with what's called sales reluctance, but here's the good news. Unlike Unlike the queen, I think that's what they, I think that's what people call her, the queen, Lady Gaga, and that what they call her, Mary, the queen. Unlike what Lady Gaga says is that you're born this way. That is not the case as it relates to sales reluctances. That is not the case. So Gaga might be right on a lot of things, but specifically she's not right as it relates to your sales reluctances. Or again, a reluctance is really a fear. So just to keep this in perspective for you guys is that you caught the reluctance like a virus. So it's like the coronavirus, but instead it's a sales virus, right? That's all it is. It's a sales reluctance virus. And you caught it from your experiences. You caught it from your experiences. So like right now, for example, um, some of you might have an, ex you know, might have a fear of a spider or a fear of uh, driving in a car or a fear of um, a scary movie, or you might have a fear of like a roller coaster or jumping out of an airplane. Like these are fears that people have, but they're fears that were created from some sort of like experience. Like you might not have, you might not have, um, have a fear of jumping out of an airplane because you actually did it. I personally jumped out of an airplane and had a really kind of traumatic experience from it. And so every time I see movies where people jump out of an airplane, I immediately get like the butterflies and I get the I just get freaked out about it. And so I'm actually working through that because, um, because our son Saunders, and I'm sure Elizabeth's probably going to be next online, they were begging me to take, take them uh, skydiving when they turn 18. And, uh, and so I got to like get through that fear because right now that's like the last thing on the planet I want to ever think about doing. Uh, but, 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 but just the same, that's how reluctances are created. They're created through some sort of experience um, that we kind of catch and it creates this, again, this fear in us, but just how you can get rid of a virus that's making you sick. You can also get rid of a sales reluctance 
that is making you miss your sales quotas. That's missing you. That's making you sales sick. I like that. I like that, Mary. Making you sales sick. So, so that's that's. Um, so we're going to cover a lot of things today. We're going to cover you know how many salespeople quit before they succeed because of sales fear. Uh, in just a second, we're going to go through all sixteen different types of sales reluctances. We're going to actually kind of kind of walk you through like an, your own kind of informal assessment. We're going to call out each reluctance. And then you're just going to say kind of yes or no to yourself on a piece of paper. So make sure you have some sort of piece of paper handy uh, that you can decide if that's a reluctance that you're dealing with. Uh, we're going to talk about what the reluctances are really costing you. Uh, and then we are going to uh, share with you a process to overcome, you know, all of those reluctances. But, but this is a cool topic, guys. This is something that, you know, you don't hear about a lot from people. We're always talking, talking about how to like help you sell more and teach you the techniques, like what to say and what to do. But if you've got a reluctance that prevents you from saying those things or doing those things, it's almost as if you never were taught that to begin with, you know? So instead of being, you know, kind of ignorant by choice, you're actually ignorant by the reluctance because you, you, you kind of know what to do and you know, if you were to do it, you would be successful, but you just don't do it. Not because you're not motivated, not because you don't want to, not because you don't know how, but because you get, you've got this kind of reluctance or fear that is preventing you from doing it. So, Mary, Mary, here's a quiz for you. Do you know what percentage of veteran salespeople admit to having one or more episodes of sales call reluctance? I mean, I would think 100%, but is that not right? You're ab- no, you're absolutely correct. Yeah, I mean, every, every, yes. every, every <laughs> veteran salesperson will admit once they finally figure it out, they will have some area of reluctance that will prevent them from, you know, from earning what they're truly worth, right? And I want you guys to write that down right now. You know, what a, I want you to write down this question for yourself. And that is, am I earning what I'm truly worth? Am I earning what I'm truly worth? And, you know, again, you guys signed up to be in a sales job because you wanted the opportunity to make more money. But if there's, if, if you're not earning what you're, what you're truly worth and what you believe you're worth, then we got to do something about it. So the other stat that I want you guys to write down is this, and that is 80% of sales professionals fail in the first year because they're not getting in front of enough prospective buyers to hit their targets. So 80% of sales professionals fail in the first year because they're not getting in front of enough prospective buyers to hit their targets. So, and you've seen that before, right, Mary? I mean, you've seen just from all the training that you do and the experiences that you you obviously helping um, our clients out, uh, just you see that all the time, right? Yeah, and sometimes it's you know, well, all the time it's it's when somebody hits a slump. Most of the time, they've acquired a leash. They've a requ- requ- they've acquired a reluctance, and it's snuck up. It's gotten them. And now the reluctance is winning. So we have them all the time. And what's really interesting in working with salespeople is one of two things is happening. And I love, I'm glad I was right with that statistic of 100% no once it's explained to them. But one of two things is happening. It's either there's something that makes them so uncomfortable in their job that they put all this ritual around it. So if, if it's, you know, following up and, and calling people on the phone, that phone prospecting makes somebody really nervous. There's a ritual that's put around it. Okay. Before I do it, I'm going to go get my coffee and then I'm going to talk to somebody that helps me make, makes me feel good. Then I'm going to listen to this powerful music and I'm going to pump myself up so I can go and make these phone calls that I really don't want to do. So we either have a ritual or, and that's how we win against it, or it just, it wins. The reluctance is winning and the person is not making the, the prospecting phone calls they're supposed to make. And so that's the, the question on both sides of these as we start going through it for people is, is this something that I have a ritual around? Is this something that I'm managing my stress level in this area? And and I, I like, you know, you said that 100% know that when they do this, they're going to make more money. And I, I love that. And it's true. And that's what we're always teaching is how to get more sales and how to, how to earn more. But for me, the most important thing about this work that we're talking about today is it's how as a salesperson to get your body in alignment with what your head knows. So your head knows, 
asking somebody for money or to buy is the right thing. Your head knows follow up with people. But sometimes our neck muscles and our stomach um, and our back muscles and our sleep cycles don't get the memo. And we're in physical distress because of the stress and anxiety. And so now through this work, yes, you're going to make more money. Yes, you're going to be on leaderboards. Yes, you're going to make President's Club. But at the end of the day, who, what you're going to take away, what you're going to love and feel good about is, I sleep through the night well. My stomach feels good. I don't have headaches. The tension in my neck is gone and I can move my body freely. That's the the real takeaway here, which is different than the other times. It's just about, you know, improving more lives and, and how do we make more sales? This is about uh, relieving your anxiety and stress, which is huge. That's it. So we're going to show you again, we're going to show you today some, some techniques that you can use to uh, to get through this stuff. First, you have to have awareness. Awareness is the birthplace for change. Uh, I first took this assessment. I'm 40. I'll be 44 in a, in a day. Super excited about that. So I'll be 44 and um, in a day. And and I took this assessment for the first time. I think I was 21. So do the math on that. So I've taken this assessment multiple times. Um, and, and speaking of assessment, we have the greatest takeaway today of all takeaways uh, because we are offering right now for the first 50 people that sign up, um, we're offering you a free assessment. So this assessment normally costs $200, uh, but with the assessment, you're also going to get a one hour assessment review call with one of our coaches to go over your reluctances and start kind of giving you some, basically some free coaching that would normally cost about a thousand dollars. So you're getting a, you're getting over a thousand dollar value right now. Um, in this again, so we're only going to do it for the first 50, so if you're interested in that, I'm sure there's a link right now that's going to be put up on the comments. And so just be the first 50 to register. And then again, they'll, they'll set you up with that, um, that chart. So think of your, think of taking this assessment is like the MRI for your sales success. I mean, think about how often, you know, we, people go and get their physicals or when they, you know, they get to a certain age, they go get, you know, they go get that stuff, right. To get, figure out what's going on. They get, we, Mary, Mary, Mary and I get blood work done every quarter, you know, so we're always doing this to kind of figure out what's happening. My Sunday school teacher growing up was Zig Ziglar. He would always say, take a, you know, get a checkup from the neck up, which is, um, which is obviously our mental game. And this assessment basically is that it's like an MRI for your, for your sales success. It'll show you the exact specific areas where you're leaving money on the table, not personality based, but behaviorally. So I want to get into that for you guys. I want to teach you a lot of things. And I want Mary to actually teach the um, performance, the performance formula. I want her to teach that to everyone because it's it really kind of frames what we're going to learn today. But before we do though, just a few things I want to make sure you guys note out, you know, pay attention to is number one. Uh, I want to again, shout out to all the people that are watching right now. We are, we are uh, streaming this live on LinkedIn. We're streaming this live on Facebook, we're streaming this live on YouTubes. So we're on all of the different platforms right now that people can watch. Specifically right now, um, if you're on one of those platforms, that's phenomenal. Uh, the conversation that we're having is specifically on LinkedIn. So if you want to kind of also see us on LinkedIn or have that conversation with our team and see all the chats, uh, that's going to be um, absolutely, absolutely on LinkedIn. Uh, also, you know, go ahead and go ahead and shout out, you know, where you are, where you're, where you're coming from, put, up the, put that on, on uh, the comments as well. i uh, love to recognize you. Um, of course, in the chats, I see a lot of people we got Looks like we got Aaron from Pilots on here. We got uh, people from Epcon. Uh, we got all different types of companies. Looks like the Army's on. So that's kind of cool. So um, right now we're actually training the U.S. Army in the recruiting department. So helping them out with their mission. So we're very blessed and uh, to serve our country in that way. Uh, I also want you guys to hit the attend button. So that's a really kind of new thing that we didn't really realize. You hit the attend button on the LinkedIn Live. Um, it will... Um, You'll immediately see a new thing. You'll see a, a, on the right-hand side, you'll see a thing called networking, which will allow you to kind of connect to the other people that are watching the stream, and uh, which is great. So you can immediately connect to those people um, and instant message them, uh, or whatever, it's instant message, that's not the right word. I am, connect, direct message, direct message them, uh, which April, our head of sales told me recently that uh, we have limits on your connections. You have limits on your connections with LinkedIn, as we probably all know. But if you somehow do it during this time, this window, while this LinkedIn is going, then it doesn't take away from your connections. So you only have like 100, I believe, a week. And this doesn't take away from that if you connect right now. So everyone connect with us. We'll connect with you. 
Um, and that's that. And my last housekeeping we'll announce for you guys today is um, we we'll always have questions during this time. And so we do have coaches standing by that want to help and serve you. And they will stay on a little bit after the, the LinkedIn, but they're also on right now. So there's going to be a Zoom link, Zoom link that's in the comments. Just click the Zoom link and you'll be transported right to a Zoom room where these coaches can specifically um, help you and, of course, give you a pay raise to earn what you're truly worth. But a lot to talk about today, so let's get right to it. So uh, jump in, Mary, and, and uh, just let's frame this with the performance formula. Great. So performance formula is performance equals knowledge minus leashes. So performance, how much somebody sells, what their units of sale, sales are, is equal to their knowledge minus leash, leashes. So the knowledge is all the stuff that we know, right? Obviously that we need to know in order to make our sales. We have to know our product. We need to know our brand. We have to know our industry. We have to know a sales process. We need to know um, how our, our financing, all of that is under knowledge. Now we think, right? And because how does a traditional school right now teach us is that whatever you know, will lead straight to performance. But when it comes to sales, just not true. So that knowledge, there's a lot of times that we know what to do, but we don't do it. And the reason we don't do it are the leashes. That's the head trash that gets in the way that keeps us from acting on our knowledge. Or as my father, Blaine Wrench would always say, uh, being a choke artist. Mary Marshall, don't be a choke artist. When you get out there on the track, do what you know to do. Don't panic in the moment and do something differently, right? Act on your knowledge. Now, when do we not is, so let's say this, we know to follow up, but then all of a sudden that phone gets very scary at that moment. We know what to do, but we don't want to do it. So we put it back down. Our leashes got the best of us. So the leashes are the head trash. It's the, the thing, it's the voice in your head that says, you know, Mary Marshall, if you call right now, they're probably in the middle of a very big meeting and you're going to interrupt them and then they're not going to like you anymore. So you probably shouldn't call right now. Maybe you should follow up later. And then later you go, well, you know, Mary Marshall, you probably shouldn't follow up right now because they're probably um, at lunch and having a lunch meeting. If you interrupt during lunch, you know, people hate getting phone calls during lunch. So they're not going to do business with you. So then you go, okay, I'll call later on. And it's the end of the day. Well, they're probably, they're probably home with their family by now. So I just really don't want to I'm going to interrupt that. I'll mess up the whole thing. So it's that voice and that message that tells you all of these excuses. And a lot of times the excuses sound really good, but these excuses that tell us not to do the knowledge and the processes that we know to do. So those are the leashes. So if we have a lot of times, if we have somebody that has a knowledge, you know this, you, you might have been this person before you've worked with this person that they are amazing. They've been in the industry 10 plus years. There is nothing new for them to learn. We go in and teach these clients sometimes. They'll come in, Mary, what do you know about banking? I have a checking account. I don't know. I don't, I don't know. Your knowledge is more than mine. That's not what we're here. This time is the leashes. What stops you from doing the things that you know to do? So sometimes we come in just to work, just to remove leashes from people. So somebody that's worked somewhere a long time, but they're in a slump and they haven't sold. And then right on the contrast, sometimes some new snot nose, barely, barely out of being an intern comes in to sell and they're selling like crazy. How does that happen? How is that even possible? And it's because there's a lack of leashes there. And so they can have even our veteran who might be at a 10 out of 10 on knowledge if they have an eight on leashes, that performance comes to a two. Whereas sometimes we have barely out of internship, brand new salesperson, they're a three on knowledge, but they have no leashes. They don't know. There's, no, there's nothing that's stopping them. There's no experience that they're having of a voice of somebody else saying, you know, don't call back, don't follow up, don't do this. They've no, that voice doesn't exist for them. And so with zero leashes, they now have a performance of three. All of a sudden, we have somebody that's brand baby new that's outselling a veteran. That's how it's happening. And so, of course, for all of us as professionals, the, the ultimate goal is how do we get all of the knowledge? How do we all become tens on knowledge? 
know our industry, our competitors, our product, our financing, our sales process inside and out, but then also do that work to make sure that our leashes aren't there so that we can have ultimate performance every single time. So those leashes are the reluctances that we're going to go through in the assessment. They're called reluctances at FPG. We call them leashes. And that's what we'll be discussing. So what they are. So once you have awareness to it of knowing what they are, now we can look at how to get rid of them. Even sometimes knowing that it's possible to not have them, that it's possible to get rid of them can be enough to start that process in removing them. Boom. Well said. So that formula, performance equals knowledge minus leashes, you know, sales warriors that are listening right now. I mean, this, 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 we, it's, we took, I don't know, it took us probably 20 years to figure out the simplicity of this formula, but I mean, that really sums up everything, right? It's not about, it's not about just what you know. It's not about just like, I, I learned this stuff. I'm immediately going to do it. It's about removing the resistance, about removing the fear about the things that you, that you know to do. It's just, you just don't do them for some reason. What is that leash? What's that, what's that resistance that's holding you back? And that's what this stuff is. So let me share with you a real life example of, of um, how I personally lost about three to $5 million in, uh, in revenue because of a reluctance that I have. Okay, so here we go. This is the moment. So you guys know, hi, I'm Jason Forrest and I'm a recovering friends and family reluctance person. So I, I, have, I had a reluctance that... Um, was uh, in my mind, I, you know, you don't, you don't kind of set, you don't cross the, the relationship between friends and in business or family and business. And, and so, you know, I just kind of told myself that story. And that story was that, you know, I'm going to sell to people that I don't know. I'm going to sell to those complete strangers, but with my friends and my family, you know, I don't want to cross it because what if I mess up? What if the problem, you know, what if we don't perform and then I got to like deal with it on Thanksgiving and I got to deal with it at the holidays. And, and I just don't, you know, I just don't want to mess with all that stuff. So that's the, that's the story that I told myself inside my head, right? That's what I told myself. And, and, um, and so, you know, I really wanted to overcome this reluctance. And so, and so I, and I knew I had it. And so I, I, you know, decided to run towards the roar, right? I decided to, it's an old story of how lions hunt gazelle. They, the oldest lion you know, roars really, really loud when the young, the young lion flank the gazelle and if the gazelle would just run, run towards the roar, they would easily get past the old toothless lion, but instead they run away from the roar. They run away from, they run away from their fear. And so because of that, they get eaten by the young lion. So I decided to run towards the roar and uh, psych myself up. And I finally committed that I'm going to call, I'm going to call my um, uh, family member who, who was, who at the time was the owner, I'm sorry, was the, uh, the CEO of men's warehouse. And, uh, and so I call him up and I said, Hey, Hey, Neil, Hey, Neil, this is, you know, this is your nephew, Jason. And, and, uh, you know, I know, I, I don't know if you really know what I do uh, specifically, but, you know, I own this company, FPG, and, and uh, we've had tremendous success, you know, helping companies like Art Van Furniture. Uh, we, gosh, we increased their revenue by $197 million. And, and, uh, and, and I know that we can 100%, you know, help you guys out as well, you know, sell more men's clothing and more suits. And, and uh, you know, that's my background when I, was, when I was younger. I was in that space as well, as you know, and so I know we can help you. And so I just wanted to start the conversation and figure out what you're using for sales training currently and, and what your biggest problems are when it comes to your, your, your uh, salespeople's performance and, and, uh, and, and just get a shot to show you how what we can do for you. And so Neil immediately said, Jason, that sounds phenomenal. He said, I wish you would have called me like six months ago. And I said, what are you, what are you, what are you talking about? And he said, he said, I just retired. I just retired from men's warehouse. And if you would have called me six months ago, I mean, it would have been a different, I would have been, I would have loved to use you. And it sounds like you got a great program and order selling sounds phenomenal. And yeah, I'd love to, I'd love to keep it in the family, but I'm gone now. I mean, that right there was a three to 5 million easily sale that I lost. And I could think of many, many more that I've lost as well, because I just, I let fear get the best of me, right? I let fear kind of overtake me. And and I told myself a story that, you know what, I got, I, I, I'm kind of fearless in a lot of the other reluctances. And so what's the point, you know, I'll just, I'll just kind of avoid the friends and family thing and I won't go after them and I'll just go after complete strangers. But I mean, that's a specific one right there that cost me a lot of revenue and it would have been obviously a really cool account. We could have, could have been working with men's warehouse and, and it's all because again, I let fear get the best of me. So 
right now, um, this stuff is, is big. It's, it, it definitely costs you a lot of money. And so what we're going to do right now, Mary and I, we're going to go through the 16 different types of reluctances. And um, uh, Mary, we'll just call, I'm just going to go one at a time, right? We'll go one at a time back and forth. And, um, and we're going to give you a quick description. We'll give you a quick description of the reluctance. And if you find yourself, uh, you find yourself kind of having this, like you feel like, yep, I can kind of identify with this reluctance a little bit, uh, then just put, you know, put a yes next to it. So if you want to kind of number your page one through 16, we're going to go through all 16 of them. So I would just kind of say yes to it. If you, if you don't think, feel like you have it, then say no, or you could say maybe, right? So no, maybe yes. Uh, and, and that'll at least give you kind of a, an initial baseline. Now, of course, if you're one of the first 50 people that uh, that signs up, you can actually take the, the full assessment, which is, again, it's like the MRI, but at least this will kind of give you, you know, some some in, initial insight of, of some specific situational areas where you are putting, you're leaving money on the table, like you're leaving commission and you're leaving money on the table. And it's something that you need to, you need to fix, right? We got, we all got to fix this stuff. So uh, so I'll go to the first one. First one's called Doomsayer. <clears throat> so number one, Doomsayer. So Doomsayer is you just have an overall kind of uh, risk aversion of things. And so um, when it comes to maybe like new sales techniques, new scripts, uh, new strategies that you might want to uh, think about trying out, uh, you're a little bit hesitant to kind of like try those new things. Uh, you want to kind of see a lot of kind of proof points out there before you kind of try those new things. So a little bit more kind of risk averse when it comes to trying new things. So again, right now, is that a reluctance? Is that a no? Is that a maybe? Or is that a yes? All right. Next, next one is over preparer. Perfect. So over preparer is exactly what it sounds like. It's somebody that spends a lot of time getting ready to sell. So they're probably like a really good stalker online. They find out everything they need more than they need to know about the prospect. Um, so that to make them feel better about making the sale. The problem here, of course, is they don't talk to near as many people as they need to or should because they're spending so much time getting ready to sell and very little time of their day selling. So if that sounds like you, that would be a yes. And if you're selling yourselves, no, of course not. I need three hours preparing to sell. It also might be you. Perfect. Okay. The next one is hyper pro hyper pro. Now this is one that I also dealt with You're like, Dan, Jason's like, you get all these reluctances. <laughs> so hyper pro is your dress for success. It's your dress for success. It's, 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 um, it's believing that if you don't kind of look a certain part, if you don't, uh, talk a certain part, talk a certain way, meaning you, you have to use, you know, the right words, the right enunciation of things um, that people just won't respect you. So again, true story, this, what this came from is I was at Merrill Lynch and they would call it the Merrill Lynch handshake. And so um, my first job out of college, they would come to us and they would kind of act like they're shaking our hand, the broker would, and he would like pull open our tie and he wanted to make sure our tie was at least like a hundred dollar tie or our suit was Armani or Zinnia. Well, that was ridiculous, right? So we put so much energy on like dressing the part or driving the right car. And our perception was if we weren't driving the right car or wearing the right shoes or looking the right part, then again, customers would not trust us. They wouldn't respect us. Uh, they wouldn't definitely buy from us. Um, and so that was a big thing right there. So again, if you have that, so put, put no, maybe, or yes, that you might, have a little bit of worry that if you have a stain on your shirt, then you feel maybe a little bit kind of uh, not as powerful, not as strong. If your hair is not perfect, you don't feel as powerful or as strong. That would be hyper pro. So the fourth one is role rejection. Yes, role rejection. So this is having a part of you that believes or believes other people think that sales is sleazy or dirty, or have you ever said something like, I don't want to be a used car salesman as if there's anything not honorable about being a used car salesman. We're using this in a very derogatory way. So any of that. So a lot of times you'll see role rejection come up 
when somebody doesn't say that they are a salesperson, they have another word for it of a client liaison or a relationship manager, um, instead of saying I'm a salesperson. So again, think about when you're at um, a cocktail party and you meet somebody and they ask what you do. Do you come out right away and say, I'm in sales, or do you do something to kind of soften it to pretend like that's not exactly what you do? Now, it's interesting is a lot of times, like all of these, right, Jason, they come from our programming. They come from our background and what we've heard. And so we come by these honestly. They're just now beliefs that aren't serving us. And so what's really interesting is I have grown up in a very sales positive family. I have from a long lineage of sales warriors. And, um, I remember growing up, I was uh, maybe in in eighth, ninth grade, and uh, one of my dad's sales reps was coming over for dinner that night. And I, I said, mom, tell me about him. And she said, oh, you know, he's like a typical sales guy. And I said, mom, I'm like 12. I don't know what that means. Like, what's a typical sales guy? And she goes, oh, well, you know, I mean, he's he's smart. And he's well spoken and he's really sharp and he's funny and he wants to help people and he finds solutions and people just want to be around him, you know, a sales guy. And I said, Oh, okay, awesome. And didn't think about it again. So later on, I'm 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 getting ready to graduate from college. And at the time I'm bartending. Fun fact, actually, where Jason and I met the first time. So I'm there as a bartender um, and and I've just gotten my first job in sales. And so one of my really good friends is in there and I'm behind the bar telling him, and I said, I just, I'm so excited. I'm, I'm a sales rep. And he said, oh, Mary, I just don't picture you as a sales rep. And immediately my, my little heart just broke and hurt. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, Mary, you're just, you're so sharp and you're smart and you care about people and you find solutions and, and you're well-spoken and people want to be around you. You're not a salesperson. And it was at that moment, I realized my friend, Jeff, he didn't grow up in a sales positive home. He grew up hearing that salespeople weren't good. So that was his his um, reaction to sales professionals was the opposite of mine. So sometimes we grow up or we hear these negative things, they become somewhat internalized, and then we get the job as sales as a sales rep, a salesperson, a sales professional, and we try to maneuver it to not be that because for us it's difficult. So that's what role rejection is. When I'm not 100% confident and bold and letting people know that I am a sales professional and I feel at my core that this is the most noble profession out there. Well said, well said. All right, number five is the yielder. All right, this is a big one. This is a big one. So uh, the yielder is... um, pleaser. So the yielder like really wants to help people. So their intentions are very, very strong. Um, but they're, um, they, they, they don't want to come across like pushy or uh, aggressive. And so because of that, they, in some instances, they will yield, they will yield on asking that tough question, uh, talking about money, um, uh, at, you know, leading the customer from one step to the next, you know, uh, scheduling that, Hey, before we get off the phone, let's, schedule that follow-up call. Uh, that's that yielding side. You know, that yielding side is, um, is uh, kind of holding back from, hey, so I'm curious, what's your number one area of resistance for moving forward today? Or suppose I could answer this question for you, then would you move forward today? Like you might know those things, but it's that, it's that kind of hesitation to come across like that assertive uh, or that aggressive. And so just a word smith there, aggressive means you're doing something kind of to someone uh, and assertive means you're doing something for someone. That's the difference we believe. So again, if you feel like you kind of struggle with that yielding tendency that you might uh, kind of hesitate to take the lead in a sales conversation, you might hesitate to ask those tough questions that need to be asked. You might hesitate on kind of telling the customer, Hey, the next thing we need to do is, and then that's that yielding tendency popping up. Uh, majority of salespeople do have this one, and this is the one that costs uh, organizations really the most money, and salespeople uh, cost salespeople the the most commissions. Uh, and so, again, 
you think you have this, then write um, either maybe or yes. Okay, number six is oppositional reflex. Oppositional. <laughs> yes, yeah, so oppositional reflex is that my, my reflex when somebody gives me a new technique, a new way to sell, they change any of the, the strategy to our process, my initial gut reaction is to oppose it, to say no to it, to find the faults in it. So how am I going to push away from that oppositional reflex? Now, again, every one of these, they come from these beautiful places of integrity. It's not that there's something wrong with somebody. So I want you to think about this. If you are a salesperson that early in your career, you were thrown to the wolves, you were thrown out and, and, and said, figure it out. Here's your territory, figure it out. We had to be scrappy. You had to get a little gritty. You had to be tough. And you went out there and you figured it out. Ooh, you might get a little opposition. And, and a lot of times where that's coming from is because there, we didn't early on have a lot of support. We were told to do it on our own. And so then we become seasoned, we get really good. We're still a little gritty. And somebody walks in and says, I wanna teach you a new way. I want to help you out. And we're like, no one's ever helped me out before. I've done this on my own. Who are you to tell me what to do? So again, remember, sometimes these beautiful characteristics of ourselves, they get us to a certain level. Don't, they must be removed or unlearned for us to get to the next level. And so that's something that I want you to analyze. If you if you are taught something new, and you're and immediately get very critical about it. Is that serving you? Even if it beautifully served you in the past. So I know for a lot of us and a lot of salespeople that I work with, they it was very, very helpful to get them to a certain level of success. But at some point, maybe look around and go, hmm, I'm not in the same place I used to be. And these people that are around me right now, they care about me. And we work as a team and I have a company that's investing in me and investing in helping me learn skills so that I can make more money. Okay. Okay. Maybe I can let that guard down a little bit in order to get to even the next level. So again, none of these mean that you're bad, that you're flawed. It means that you learned something that served you for a period of time, but it probably isn't serving you to get to the next level. So that's our oppositional reflex. Perfect. All right. And if just for the record, if you find yourself kind of disagreeing with her, then you might actually have oppositional reflex. That's kind of the, that's some, sometimes the trick of the whole thing, right? So, all right. Number or seven. The assessment, right, Jason? <laughs> Usually yeah. if somebody says, I don't think my assessment's right. I want to ask you very specific. I want to know about this specific question. I don't have to look at the assessment to know that there's oppositional reflex there. Yeah. Is what it is. Okay, so uh, so number seven is stage fright. Okay, this is an interesting one. So look, the great Jerry Seinfeld would say that people would rather be uh, in the ground than doing the eulogy. So a lot of people do have stage fright, and obviously the general population has sales stage fright, and it carries over to the sales population as well. Uh, so so you have stage fright if uh, you don't like role play. You don't like role playing in front of your group of people. That's usually stage fright. It's not that you don't like role play. It's that you don't like performing in front of an audience uh, or you're asked to do some sort of kind of group presentation and you know it's the right thing to do because if, you've got to, if you could pitch to 15 people, that's way better than pitching to one, right? I mean, just think of the numbers. Uh, but again, you get kind of clammy hands, you get dry mouth, your, your, um, your heart kind of, kind of flutters, you get maybe stomach pains, uh, you know, fear is physical. Fear is very physical. And so that would be stage fright. Uh, where it's where stage fright's coming into the modern world right now is in Zoom, in Zoom or in Microsoft Teams, or if you're uh, still like, you know, some of the uh, some of the companies out there that are having got with the times and are using platforms like WebEx, which is like MySpace when I was a kid, right? So um, not to knock uh, WebEx there, but, but the, so like, so the idea is if, if you feel like I'm on stage, right, I'm performing on zoom, I'm performing when I'm doing this presentation and I've got like five or six different people that are kind of all looking at me at the same time. And you feel like you're not as powerful. You feel like you're not as assertive, not as strong than you are that one-on-one -on -one conversation <clears throat> that is stage fright. 
So again, just think about what that's costing you though. Because if you can, if you can be just as powerful and talk to 10 people as you are talking to one person, wow, that is, that is so much more efficient and effective when it comes to your time. So that is stage fright. All right. So number eight is social self-conscious. Yes. So this one, the majority of time that I'm working with a salesperson or speaking with a sales manager and they say, I don't know what's going on, Mary. Just in some cases, the salesperson loses confidence or the salesperson knows. And they tell me, Mary, I don't know. Sometimes I'm super confident. I feel amazing. And sometimes I feel awful. It's usually social self-conscious. So looking at situations is when is the sales professional less bold? So maybe a sales professional is really amazing at selling and feels really strong unless they're speaking with somebody that is wealthier than they are. So as long as they're at an equal um, affluence level, they're fine, they're bold, they follow their process, they do everything they know to do, they follow up, they ask for the clothes. But if the person's too wealthy, now they feel like, okay, who am I to tell them how to spend their money? I mean, clearly they're better with money than I am. Hear the voice in the head? That's the excuse that comes up. So social self-conscious shows up, one, and wealth and affluence. The second way is power. So maybe the person's title or their influence, or they have so many social media followers, or they have uh, they 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 have a very large title in the community or within an organization, and we go the the internal voice because I don't know who am I to ask them to buy, and so in those situations, the sales professional shirks back and becomes a little less bold. And there's one more way that social self conscious um, shows up, and that's with education. So one of the beautiful and my favorite things about sales is that you can be a top sales professional with any education level, any education, as much or as little. And you can be a top person making really big, big money and changing a lot of people's lives. But with that, sometimes deep down, there's now this un, uh, there's a discomfort around people that have a lot of letters after their names or anybody that has um, maybe a college education or a master's degree. So they start to go, man, that person's so educated. Who am I to tell them how to spend their money? They're clearly smart. Who am I to be the guidance there? And they shrink back and aren't their bold, beautiful self in that moment. And so in all of those, it's looking at, so wealth, power, and education. Those are the three places that sometimes a salesperson will pull themselves back, stop their own sale. It's really interesting. I've seen this so many times. You might even be looking back at your career. And a lot of times when this comes up is somebody says, Mary, I don't know. I've been a top person for so many years and I don't know what's going on. And then we'll recognize that their territory has changed and now they're selling to a more affluent environment. Or maybe um, they're selling homes and a big company has opened up or a new university has opened up in their area and there's an influx of college professors or engineers or doctors coming to work at a hospital. And all of a sudden you see the salesperson's numbers start to drop and it has nothing to do with anything other than this social self-conscious coming up with education or position that's making them feel less comfortable. So you might notice that maybe if, even if this isn't uh, bothering you right now, it's not something that's affecting you. Think about your next product you're selling with your company or the next uh, place of growth, the next, the next service or product that you're going to sell. Is that going to show up for you? Because a ton, a ton of money is lost in this area just because we are selling we aren't selling to all the way that we sell to those that we're really comfortable with. So imagine if you were just as comfortable selling to all people what you would be what would be capable and what would be possible for you. All right. So number nine and ten, I'm going to do together. So for nine, I want you to write friends, and for ten, I want you to write family. I'm going to do them basically together. They're basically the same thing, right? So I've already I told you my story about. Uh, again, I don't want to cross kind of business with friends and family. Uh, and that's what this basically is. So if you, if you have friend shield, then you 
um, again, just don't like talking about business and you don't like promoting yourself to your friends. You don't uh, like trying to sell or network for your friends. Uh, you don't like talking to your friends about, um, about their personal business, even though if you could help them, even though if you, uh, you like, are like us and you have a service that could, get, could potentially help them, uh, but you don't, you don't call on them. You don't go after them. So another story of a salesperson we helped, uh, this was a realtor and this applies a lot to the realtor world and the, the insurance world and the stockbroker world. And, um, and it was interesting because, you know, she, she admitted to us in one of the classes, because we have this program called Engage that will actually show you your reluctances, but take you through a six week experience to completely remove all of that fear. So it's a very life changing experience to go through that fear. And one of the things that she admitted to was that, um, what was that she was a realtor and, um, and one of her like best friends, like a really good friend that she knew at church that she hangs out with and so forth, just didn't use her when it came to listing her house. And I asked her, I said, you know, what, what happened? She said, she said, she went and confronted and said, did you know that I'm a realtor? And her good friend said, I did not know that you're a realtor. I didn't know if I would have known, I would have of course given you the listing, but I didn't know. Isn't that interesting. There was so much reluctance that was going on there that, um, that even though they went to church together, even though they hung out, even though they had friend, like kids that you know were on the same soccer team and baseball teams and so forth, just didn't say what she did for a living. Like, think about that right now, guys. Think about how many like soccer, you know, how many, how many of your how many of you right now have kids that are on that have soccer teams and baseball teams and football teams or dance groups, and you are just hanging out with the moms, you're hanging out with the dads, you're just, you're just doing that, which is what we do, right? Whenever Mary and I go and watch Elizabeth play soccer, we're on the sidelines and we're just hanging out, watching our kids. How many of those people right now, like know what you do, like they know what you do for a living and you promote what you do. You talk about what you do and you look for opportunities to potentially help them and serve them through your products and services. Cause you have a solution to a problem that they might have. So that's friend shield. The same thing applies to fam shield, which is number 10 is that, again, you would have that same kind of fear reluctance that your, your family really doesn't know what you do. And you don't, again, actively promote to them and bring it up in those kind of family type situations. You, you don't um, like right now, if you, if you feel like you've got a product or service that can truly help anyone in your family and you have not like proactively reached out to him in the last 30 days, you probably have, you probably have this reluctance. Uh, so that would be fam shield. So uh, let's, we're going to go through a little bit faster, Mary, through the, through the next one. So, or the next several. So we've got uh, the next one is number 11 and that's referral aversion. Perfect. Super easy. Doesn't want to ask for referrals. Now, before I talked about, there's that voice in the head telling the, the true reasons, right? Which are really reluctant reluctances and leashes of why not. So, if there's ever been a time where you think, you know, I know to ask for referrals. I know I've heard that, but I might look needy or desperate. I don't want to do it because what if they think that I don't have enough business or I can't do this on my own? Then you might have referral aversion. So this is any time that you postpone um, or make excuses to not ask for referrals. Perfect. All right. Number 12, telephobia. So this is where you just hesitate on making those follow-up calls. You hesitate on, on reach. It's not just cold calls. Cold calls are a thing, but you also hesitate on making those follow-up calls. So if you feel like, well, you know what? I just want to call them in the morning because they're with their family. I don't call them during the day because they're like at work. And I don't want to call them at night because they're, you know, they're probably tired. And again, they're with their family again. And, and so I just don't really call them. I mean, I'll, I'll text them. I'll I'll, uh, I'll email them. I mean, I just do a lot of things, but I mean, picking up the phone, I mean, it just seems like, I just don't think they're going to want that. That's telephobia. So if you feel like you, you hesitate on using that phone as a vehicle to, uh, again, to move sales forward uh, and you, you, you wait for them to kind of tell you they're interested in talking to you next, you don't just call them, then that would be that telephobia. So number 13 is online prospecting discomfort, online prospecting discomfort. Yes. I don't know if you remember, Jason, we first started talking about this with people. They were like, this doesn't matter. Why are we talking about this? And then all of a sudden it did matter. So online prospecting discomfort is I feel uncomfortable selling prospecting on social media. 
on Zoom. Anything that's online, I don't want to sell that way. I don't want to use my social media. I don't want to do Zoom for, for anything. And, and people say, why? I don't need to do this. I don't need to. It's another right. Any of them, you go, mm, doesn't apply to me. I don't need this. Might be a reluctance there. And there could be truth to it, but there's also still probably a reluctance there as well. So that was coming up a lot. We talked about this and then all of a sudden, you know, a couple of years ago, the country locks down. Everyone has to sell over Zoom. And this becomes one of the most important scales that, that we looked at and that we started working with was what do we do that way? And then also, if you're ever not having your own traffic come in, right? So you're like, marketing, where's marketing? Where's my traffic? What do they do? What's that marketing department doing over there? Then, then also maybe there might be some online prospecting discomfort because those that don't have this reluctance that are out um, promoting themselves on social media, they're bringing in a lot of their own traffic. And so through that, you're knowing that uh, that, that is not an issue for you. Perfect. All right. Uh, number 14 is complex sales. Okay. So in the business to consumer world, uh, this like selling houses, for example, this would be selling to the husband and the wife uh, and the realtor and kind of like selling all of them at the same time and kind of working all of the dynamics of that. Uh, in the B2B sales, this is B2B sales, right? It's, it's, it's working all of those gatekeepers. It's uh, working the influencer with the decision maker, with the person who's in charge of the money. I mean, it's just, it's work, it's navigating all of that. And it's the politics of, really, of it really. I love, I love this part. This is so much fun. But that's just me. So if you don't love it like I do, then this is a reluctance for you. And just think about it this way. If you're going up against a salesperson that loves the politics of it, loves navigating it, loves, you know, getting the influencer to like have a conversation with the money person and say good things about you or, you know, to Get, get, get in with the gatekeeper and the executive assistant and get the gatekeeper to say positive things about you and, and give you the inside scoop on who the competition is and, and what do they think about the competition internally. And you don't, you're not working all those angles like that. Wow. What if your competition is? What if your competition is? If you're going up against a salesperson who like loves the complex sale and like thinks it's like the greatest fun game on the planet and you are probably losing sales if you if you have a reluctance in that area. So that's complex sales. Number 15 is sales extensions. Perfect. So this is your cross-selling, upselling, on-selling, anytime that we are adding on to the original sale. So if you're the type of person that gets the sale and thinks, oh my God, that's done. It's over. Thank God. Oh no, I'm not going to add anything on. They've said yes. This is like a delicate little thing now. If I add anything to it, it might kill the whole sale, then you have a sales extension reluctance. If somebody says yes to you and you're like, game on, let's keep going. Okay. And now this, and now let me see another way to improve your life. And we're going to add this on and this on and this on until they say no more. Then you are somebody that does not have sales extension reluctance. So sales extensions, anytime on selling, upselling or cross selling, you go, not comfortable there. All right. All right. We got lots of people on LinkedIn. So I was checking out everyone. So, uh, all right. Number 16 is the big daddy, right? This is like the big daddy of the reluctances. It's arranging payment. What does that mean, Jason? Well, you could do everything else right, right? I mean, you could, you could, you could be assertive. You could lead the sale. You could show them all the value. You could get them to admit all their problems that they have. You know, how, how uh, they don't make a change, that, that what the cost of change is. You could do all the things right that we teach you, by the way, in our upcoming book, uh, Warrior Selling, the 12-step process to 100% conversion rate. It's coming out. Um, it's being published in uh, October and all the pre-sales are happening right now. So definitely go out there and, and get that pre-sale for me so we can push to best seller status when it comes out. Um, and that would be super, super um I'd be very grateful if you were to do that for me. So, um, but you could do everything that the book tells you to do, but you, you, you stop short on arranging payment, right? You, you don't, you don't, you don't go for that final close of, Hey, so based upon that, are you ready to move forward today? Like you don't go for that final close and you just kind of leave it in their hands of, 
all right, well, you have the information now. So tell me what you're, tell me what you guys want to do. How long do you think you'll make a decision? Like all those kind of things that, that again, if you have a ranging payment, you would, um, you would hold back on. Okay. So we have a lot of kind of things to kind of wrap up here. And I want to kind of share with you one final story that I think really kind of sum, summarizes all of this um, kind of perfectly. Again, we've got sales coaches right now standing by. They can help you with whatever questions you have. Uh, I'm not sure if, uh, the first 50 people have taken advantage of the opportunity. If you are, uh, if, you, if you haven't, go ahead and put your name in the hat because that's, again, a phenomenal offering. It's over a $1,000 value to, to have that. So I can only afford, we can only afford to do the first uh, to first 50, uh, which is pretty pretty cool stuff. I can't stress this enough. Like this is the moneymaker. Again, I have an entire, we have an entire course called Engage. It's a six-week experience that will uh, show you how to remove all these reluctances. Uh, that really is, I don't know, probably the single best investment you could probably ever make in your entire life because it's guaranteed ROI when you go through the engage work and you work on that stuff. Uh, I have one final story, though, that I want to share uh, about uh, the importance of this. Mary, any final thoughts from you before I share the story? No, I'm just excited for everybody. I, I want to hear from you when you are feeling happier and healthier and more that that is my motivation and the greatest gift that you can give me is to let me know that you did talk to one of our coaches um, that you did do some of this work and removed it and that you now feel better in your body that would be the greatest gift to be to to know that so please share that and let me celebrate with you when um, you are feeling free and healthy and happy and beautiful love that strengthened right i mean who doesn't want to be like strengthened and excited and, and to go to work every day and, and not at the end of the day feel so just beat down and worn out and and um, that, that's those are reluctances those, those fears are what are what's holding us back from that true joy like Mary said so so really quick final thoughts from everyone I'm going to share the story with you that I think really sums up everything kind of beautifully and that is um, when I uh, when I was in high school I uh, I was asked to go to the Air Force Academy I got an appointment to play football for them. And I turned it down. There was just kind of something in my gut that said uh, not to go to the Air Force Academy. And then, so I decided to go to TCU and I decided to be in the, RO, the Air Force ROTC and, um, and had a great time in the Air Force ROTC. And right um, going into my senior year, I was supposed to sign on the dotted line to serve 12 years in the Air Force and be a fighter pilot. That was in 2000. I would have been like an F-22 pilot, got the pilot slot, super ready to go. But then again, something in my gut just said, don't do this. Like, don't do this. But I will tell you, I've always kind of struggled with it, right? It was, I always kind of had this regret that I really am a huge patriot and I want to serve my country. And, and um, just, I've just always been a warrior. I mean, again, our program's called Warrior Selling, right? So I've always had that warrior spirit in me and wanted to kind of protect people that need to be protected, which is what a warrior does. And, um, and so all of a sudden, you know, we, we, uh, we get called on by, uh, the U.S. Army to 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 help them um, and serve them, right? And it was interesting because I spent the last uh, 24 years, 24 years studying sales and persuasion and studying um, behavioral change and removing people's leashes and figuring out the psychological restraints that hold people back from from really performing and speaking their truth and all the things that they're supposed to. Be, we do like we do for a living. That's made us uh, successful and helped many many salespeople. But all of a sudden, all of that kind of training has led me to helping the U.S. Army with, with accomplishing their mission of convincing more people to serve this ama amazing country that we have called America, right? And to serve the military and serve the country. I share that story with you because it wouldn't have happened if I didn't overcome my friend reluctance. So there was a day I'm walking the dog, walking, uh, walking these two awesome Great Dane. Great Dane uh, Doodles, uh, Crixus and Merlin. So Merlin's a magician's name and Crixus the warrior. And all of a sudden, you know, I meet my neighbor, Lewis. And we know, I've known Lewis for a long time and, and I know what he does, um, but I didn't know what he does outside of work. And so we're walking the dog together and we're having a good conversation and we're talking. And all of a sudden, you know, I'm like, hey, so what are you doing when you're not at, you're not at work? And he's, oh, well, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm former army. And so I help out this organization called AUSA. And it's a nonprofit, and we basically help the army out, um, give them some skills that they need. And uh, and I said, that's so interesting. I said because you know what I do for a living, I you know I own a sales recruiting and sales training company, 
And, uh, and, and, and I spent my entire life showing people how to convince people with their words and influence people with their words and get people to do things. And, and, uh, and I, I, I was told recently the, the army and the military is having a hard time fulfilling their mission. Is that correct? And he said, yeah, that's correct. And I said, I could really help them. I know that I know that I could read a, read a script for them to really help them uh, make their mission and, and, and show them, you know, how to convince people with their words to choose the U S army and choose the military. And he said, wow, that's really, that's really interesting. He said, let me, let me, let me do some work on that. Cause I could, they could really use, they could use someone like you. And he immediately makes some phone calls, calls the two-star general of the overall army recruitment uh, side in Fort Knox. How cool is that? Right. And, and uh, sure enough, Mary and I, you know, just a week ago are at the, at the, at the, the joint base kicking off warrior selling for 55, sell, 55 recruiters of the U S army. And so I share that with you because um, I have this like internal, like yearning, this internal calling to again, serve America, right. And to, and to, and to serve my country. But man, I didn't overcome that, that, that leash that I had, that reluctance of, 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 of kind of pitching my friend, right. Pitching my neighbor and saying, Hey, I can solve that problem for you. I know I can solve that problem. I feel very passionate about this. I could solve that problem. If I didn't like put it all on the line that day, we wouldn't be, we wouldn't be helping the army right now. We wouldn't be helping our country. And so I share that with you because, you know, right now, you know, each of you um, are obviously doing something that you believe in, right? You, you, you are representing a product or a service that you believe in. If, if uh, you know, if you don't believe in it, you should go find something else because life's short and you want to go, you want to represent something that you truly believe in. So I believe if that's true. Then right now, then what's holding you back from letting every single person that you've ever met or that you, or, or every friend, every family member, everyone needs to, needs to know what you know you can truly serve another person, you're not letting them know that, then, 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 man, we got to fix that, right? We got to, we got to release that tendency. We got to release that fear, release that, that reluctance. It's holding you back from serving again, just one more person with your product or service. So, so that's it. Hope that means something to you. Again, this is our life's work is helping salespeople like you earn what you're truly worth by giving them not just the knowledge, but in this case, removing those leashes that's holding you back. So, uh, again, until next time, we'll have another webinar next week. Uh, so definitely check us out on LinkedIn Live and, and uh, we'll give you some new truths in order to be the best version of you. Thanks a lot.